getting started, then just let me know. Uh, on my screen, it's saying on air, showing screen. Um, the session's being recorded, so I'm going to make that small. So welcome, everybody, to our second webinar from my DNA Health. And uh, I'm very glad to see that we've got, I think, 112 people listening in. Um, so we're very privileged to have everyone and honoured. Um, we met some people at the CAMS conference in London three weeks ago and got some interesting feedback on the first webinar. Um, so we've got a one hour and a bit, I think, webinar today. I'm going to try and keep this webinar down to one hour. <coughs> it's quite an involved webinar. Uh, it's a really interesting one and uh, we put a whole lot of work into it, so we hope that you enjoy it as well. Uh, and it's going to be on fat, um, how fat interacts with the body, and the genetics of fat testing, which is really a new angle to all the information that we've been having over the last couple of years about the sugar fat debate, of which I'm sure everyone's um, very well educated. <laughs> so just uh, in case um, people weren't in the first webinar, um, that's me. Um, I'm essentially a clinician. Uh, I'm a lecturer for a couple of uh, companies. And I'm very involved with my DNA Health, which is a nutritional genomics company, um, which we really focus on wellness, health, well-being. And it's all about swap testing, sending them off to the lab for your clients and for testing for um, wellness and some chronic illnesses. We combined DNA testing plus a clinical questionnaire, and we found out the last webinar why that was so important. So really, it's all to do with epigenetics. So just a little reminder about the first webinar, um, it was mainly about nutrigenomics, the fact that we have our genes, we have nutrients that combine together to form us. Um, we'll find that I'm going a little bit quickly in the first few slides because we do have 85 odd slides to get through, um, but it flows quite quickly. Uh, it starts off gently, wraps up a little bit and hopefully it gets a bit easier at the end. Um, so epigenetics is really a big buzzword in the first presentation, and it's what encompasses our DNA. It surrounds our genes. The methylation that happens in epigenetics is fascinating, and really um, we are whatever we are eating or drinking or feeling on a daily basis. So our genes are not our destiny, but they are our tendency, and that was the webinar's message last time. So whichever genes are switched on today defines who you are. Um, and therefore, doing gene tests on their own is not good enough. We have to have the clinical picture of the patient or the person at the same time. Okay, so today's question is how much does fat and how much does sugar contribute to obesity and heart attacks? And we've got a poll question. So if everyone needs their kindness to answer it, um, is dietary sugar or dietary fat the contributor? I think I've just been switched off a little bit by that. Um, there we go. I, hopefully my screen's back on. So is dietary sugar or dietary fat the biggest cause of heart attacks? Is it sugar or is it fat? That's the biggest cause of heart attacks. Yes, there'll be other things, but with those two items, what's the biggest villain, the sugar or the fat? And we should all get to see the answer of that. I'll carry on with the presentation, and I'll wait for everyone's answers to come in. So today's summary, this you're going to see three times in the slides, uh, and it summarizes what I'm going to go through. So essentially, we have two energy systems, but we tend to rely on the glucose energy system. Obesity and cardiovascular disease is a global epidemic. That's undisputed. Obesity and cardiovascular disease were thought to be caused by saturated fat in the diet. They were treated by removing saturated fat and adding carbohydrates and carbs. Obesity and cardiovascular disease are inflammatory diseases according to today's approach theories and evidence. So we've moved on from point three to what we believe today. Carbohydrates and polyunsaturated fatty acids worsen this. Saturated fats do not. Then further into that theory, vegetable oils and sugar are the twin villains of obesity. Dietary fat will still contribute to obesity and cardiovascular for some people. And at this point, you will see that the pendulum has swung all the way from being saturated fats are bad, all the way to the other side where sugar is bad. And in my belief, I think we're going to 
we're going to swing back a little bit over the next few years to see reasons why there might be a slight problem with dietary fat in some people. Um, it's not all about sugar. Uh, and then lastly, genetic tests, and we'll go through the ones that are appropriate can identify these people who become obese and ill from eating fat. So I hope that excites you, it certainly excites me, and, um, and let's crack on into it. So if we go to the first point, which was we have two energy systems, but potential lying glucose. Um, here they are, so there's the glucose, fructose um, energy system, and then there's the fat or the healthy fat energy system. And just, just a few interesting points about the benefits of fat. So the oldest one for all, eat bags, fatty bags, sorry, and bacon every day. And this is a resident at Jones who since the 19th of June has become the oldest woman in the world. Um, so she eats four strips of bacon and eggs every morning. What does this mean? It means she harnesses the ketone fat system to utilize energy. And she has survived to become the oldest woman in the world despite eating saturated fats. Another interesting point is that when we harness fat for energy, we create four times the energy that we get from glucose. So we'll see in this, I'll, I'll see if I can get to my pointer. There we go. And if you remember last time, I got a little carried away. Uh, with a point to this, we'll go to pen. And so we see that in this Krebs cycle, or the citric acid cycle, which obviously as you all know is inside every cell of the body, um, from one molecule of glucose, we could get 36 ATP molecules. And from one molecule of fatty acid, we have the potential to get 134 ATP um, ATPs um, from that fatty acid. Anything in yellow in any of these presentations um, is the reference the study um, that supports what's being said in the slide. Um, so, and you can access all of this on our website, mydnahealth.co.uk, and the full presentation with all the references will be there after the presentation. Um, another interesting point, and, and this is one that um, I, I heard about from Professor Tim Noakes and Stephen Finney, um, who is a leading doctor in the ketogenic world um, from the States. Uh, I heard about it earlier this year um, in a seminar in March, and it really is quite fascinating, and athletes are often looked at to look at the extremes of what we can do with energy um, and different nutrients. So athletes use both fat and glucose energy systems, and generally you'll see when they, they're measuring um, the outputs from athletes, um, that it's 50% from sugar and 50% of their energy is used from fat. So even in your average athlete, that's quite a lot from fat. But athletes who are keto adapted, so who have practiced using their fat stores for energy and practice switching off their insulin glucose pathways for energy, they can use up to 90% of their energy in a three hour um, marathon or cycle from fat and only 10% from sugar. I found that quite interesting. So, no one disputes that obesity is a global epidemic and 30% uh, of the world is overweight. Uh, and I never cease to get amazed by the stats. I know we've all heard them time and again, but it just, it really is quite staggering of how things have changed in the last 40 years. So. 26.9% of the UK is obese, that means it's a BMI of 30 and above, 64% of the UK is overweight, that means a BMI of 25 and above. <laughs> and then if we look at the men versus women stats, modern women in the USA now weigh the same as men in the 1960s. So there's the women's red um, line and there's the male graph from the 1960s. And then if we look on a global obesity, we look at male global obesity 2014, all the points in red are greater than 25% um, obesity. And we'll see female global obesity, um, those red areas are far more extensive throughout the world. So this is a global problem and the women seem to be leading the way in it. If we look at your standard countries of obesity, so remember not overweight but obesity, <laughs> so BMI 30 and above, the USA is still leading the bunch at obesity percentage of 33, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, South Africa where we're currently sitting at 31%, Argentina and the UK 26.9. 
uh, and then Australia. So these are divided also into first world, second world, and third world levels. But if we look at the 10 most obese nations, American Samoans come in at a staggering 74.6% obese. And Kuwait, uh, the country that drinks soda pop, comes in at 42%. So now, um, and again, I mean, this statistic just really um, um, blows me away. There are almost double the number of obese people than undernourished people in the world. So obese first world people, third world people, and undernourished. And re really the thinking behind that is it's generally more expensive to buy unprocessed fresh foods than highly processed foods. And certainly in Southern Africa, that's a big problem. So the inflation adjusted prices of fruits and vegetables increased by an average of 40% up to the year 2000, while soft drinks, chock full of sugar, fell by almost 25%. And that, I think, is a big cause of driving this problem. Obesity in Australia has been going upwards in men and women gradually from 1980. And diabetes in Australia has been going upward in a similar sort of curve. And so that really is supporting the thought from Dr. Robert Lustig, um, a leading researcher and endocrinologist from the States uh, who wrote that book, Fat Chance, that you don't die of obesity. Obesity isn't the problem per se. You die of the diseases that travel with it. So if we think that metabolic syndrome is three out of five of these points, a large waist circumference, uh, and that has become the greater thing to measure as opposed to BMI, as we know, Elevated triglycerides, lowered HDL, raised blood pressure, raised blood sugar. Three out of five of those and you have metabolic syndrome. And that metabolic syndrome then leads to the diabetes and heart disease. So it's these diseases that travel with the obesity that are the problem. Um, very sad story, as we all know, of Mr. Carl Thompson, um, who died recently, aged 33, in the UK. Um, at 65 stone, 413 kilograms, and who doubled his weight in the last three years. So the facts are there that the fatter you are, the quicker you die. And for every one unit that your BMI is above 25, you can estimate that you, you could lose one year of life. So BMI of 25 means you lose 20 years of life. So point three, obesity and cardiovascular disease were thought to be caused by saturated fat in the diet. It was treated by removing the saturated fat and adding carbohydrates and puffers. The 1990 food guidelines, um, as we're all quite aware, a diet low in fat, prefer seed oils over lard, choose margarine over butter, eat plenty of vegetables, fruits, including fruit juice, which was part of the five a day, and grains, including bread. And so I won't linger on this slide too long, we've all seen it plenty of times, but the original evidence, the Ansel Keys diet heart hypothesis was based on the seven country study. There they are, and it was a nice smooth graph saying that the more fat that we ate, the, the, the greater the chance we would have death from heart disease. <laughs> so that evolved into the three pillars of the heart or the diet heart hypothesis. So essentially, saturated fat in the diet went up, plasma LDL went up, low density lipoprotein, and heart disease went up. And that was the theory of, of the causation of heart disease. And the three pillars that supported it with their studies was that saturated fat causes raised LDL. Yes, it does. And the assumption was then that it would cause heart attacks. Polyunsaturated fatty acids reduce LDL, and the assumption was reducing heart attacks. And then thirdly, and the third pillar is that the statin tablets, the medication that doctors would use to reduce heart attacks, works by lowering LDL. And that was quite a strong pillar, and we'll show what the weaknesses in that are later. And so we all complied with the evidence. We removed fat from our diet. We replaced saturated fats with seed oils, and we started eating low-fat foods. And what happened? We removed fat from our diet. We added the puffers. You see, as the time went by, the puffers went right up. And we started eating low-fat foods. And we, we know these slides where we're all, our clients are now looking at the back of the nutritional fats, at the back of every um, non-fat, low-fat um, yogurt. And, uh, and finding that in this, sugars are 18 grams or 12 grams per 100 mil. 
and in my book, um, anything over 10 grams to 100 mil uh, is considered as high sugar. My own personal favorite, I was very sorry to see this go um, um, from, from my um, cups of tea, were the Jaffa Cakes, only one gram of fat, but nearly two teaspoons of sugars in Jaffa Cakes. And that's great advertising, isn't it? Because um, we used to think that only one gram of fat can't be bad for us, but it's two teaspoons of sugar per Jaffa Cake. So our sugar intake went up hugely um, over the last hundred years. And in 1990, the average amount of sugar consumed or added sugar was three teaspoons a day and by 2000 it was 34. And as we know, the WHO recommends six teaspoons of added sugar for women and nine teaspoons of added sugar for men. This movie has just come out, that sugar film, and um, if people are going to be joining us for the third webinar, which is the sugar gene test, um, then it would be great homework to, to watch um, before then. Um, it has relevance also for today's talk, because essentially what they showed was um, he swapped over 60 days healthy fats for a calorie equivalent 40 teaspoons of sugar a day for 60 days. He wasn't allowed to eat junk food, it had to be healthy foods with added sugar, so no Cokes or chocolate. And as a result that within 18 days he had added 10% of his body weight, 8 kilograms. Um, he'd got a fatty liver and metabolic syndrome and depression. So one of the big points of this movie it shows that a calorie is not a calorie um, and that 100 kilocals of fat does not add the weight or do the damage that 100 kilocals of glucose does. So Obesity and cardiovascular disease we are starting to see is associated with our dietary changes of removing saturated fat from our diets, replacing saturated fat with seed oils, eating low fat food. But to prove this, we need proof of causation, not proof of association, proof of causation, that it is causing it. And that causation proof must show that saturated fat is healthy, Seed oils are unhealthy and that low fat, high sugar foods cause weight gain and obesity. So what can we do to show that? So saturated fat is healthy. Well that one turns out um, is a bit of a slam dunk because the seven country study was actually the 22 country study with no evidence that a fatty diet caused cardiovascular disease as we've seen. So the original logic was that saturated fat caused plasma LDL caused heart disease. So if we break it down, dietary fat, A, raises LDL, B, that's proven. And there's plenty of studies to show that dietary fat will raise your LDL. The assumption that raised LDL will cause heart disease is flawed. There was some evidence, but not enough. And then the last bit that dietary fat will cause heart disease is unproven, but it was an assumption. So even if the Ansel Key 7 country study was not fudged, which it was, it was a study of association, it was not a study of causation. Um, within the study people talked about the French paradox, that the French eat lots of fat but have a low heart attack rate. It turns out it was the European paradox, and the countries in Europe that ate the most saturated fat suffered the lowest heart attack risk. But really what nailed the whole thing that saturated fat is good for us was the first meta-analysis of as many studies as they could in 2012 showing that saturated fat may increase LDL but removing saturated fat from the diet does not reduce heart attack risk. And this really was a turning point um, in the sugar fat debate that saturated fat does not reduce heart attack risk. And this was supported by a study last year, and it was a 72 study meta-analysis that did not support replacing saturated fat with puffins. Um, however, just on the caveats here, small groups or subgroups eating dairy or red meat may be predisposed to cardiovascular disease. And that's where I think we'll see the pendulum swing back at the end of this talk um, when we start to do a little bit of the gene tests. That essentially sugar is the big enemy, but, but there's still a couple of question marks, and particularly question marks over oxidized um, LDL. Um, and the other thing is that diets were not all screened for sugar content or corn-fed versus grass-fed meat, which is a very important point. Right, so point B, seed oils are unhealthy for us, evidence for replacing saturated fat with puffers. So if we're using the logic that saturated fat going up caused a raised plasma LDL, 
caused a raised heart disease, then it makes sense to use puffers as they lower the LDL. However, if this first statement has now been proven to be untrue, as in the meta-analysis in 2012-2014, then the second statement is no longer valid. In addition to that, puffers have been shown to promote inflammation and worsen disease. And once we heat puffers, the seed oils, they become rancid inflammatory products, and we found that omega-6 puffers lower both LDL and HDL. So if we look at the jigsaw puzzle of this, two out of the three puzzle pillars of the diet heart hypothesis have been disproven. So the omega-6 um, polyunsaturated fatty acids protecting from cardiovascular disease and saturated fat causing cardiovascular disease. So what about statins? What about statin tablets reducing cardiovascular disease by lowering LDL? The last piece of the puzzle. So we know from the 4S study that statins reduce heart attack risk and that lowering LDL by 35% with simvastatin lowered the cardiovascular mortality by 42% and the total mortality by 30%. And this is a very big European study. Um, it's undisputable, um, notably in people who had had heart attacks. But what if statins appear to reduce heart attacks by reducing LDL, but actually they work by reducing, reducing inflammation, and the LDL reduction was just a coincidence? So here's our original model, our heart diet model, the diet heart model, where saturated fat increase, increase plasma LDL, increase heart disease. And here's the model that has been supported by this study and promoted by in the 70s, Yadkin, in the 2000, Lustig, and then Finney, Noakes, Mahorta from the UK, and Teifoltz. Um, so numerous academics coming out to promote the inflammation heart hypothesis. And essentially what it says is that if we lower saturated fat intake, we generally increase carbohydrate intake. And that leads to metabolic syndrome an inflammatory condition which leads to diabetes which contributes to heart disease. So in this study 53,000 people replaced saturated fats with carbohydrates resulted in a significant increase in cardiovascular disease. So this Jacobson study really is quite seminal um, in the work of proving the inflammatory model of heart disease. But inflammation is nothing new. In 1968, we already had the inflammatory model of sugar. So Stout wrote a paper showing that a raised sugar level in the blood leads to hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, and inflammation. In 1977, part of the Framingham Heart Study showed that 80% of people with heart attacks had similar cholesterol levels to healthy people, um, which really was um, not supporting the cholesterol model. In 1998, um, Paul Ritker came out with a very important study showing that healthy middle-aged men with the highest inflammatory levels, the highest CRP levels, are three times more likely to suffer a heart attack in the next six years than men with the lowest CRP. So inflammation was seen to be central to heart attacks. And if we look at <laughs> the model of how an artery inflames, we have glucose coming into, into the artery. We have glycation of, of proteins by the glucose, that glycation leading to inflammation um, within the arterial wall, leading to cytokine messages going up into the arteries, monocytes, so white cells migrating towards the intermen into them, and then oxidized LDL, this all-important oxidized LDL, attaching to these white cells and converting them into foam cells. Those foam cells then making atherometer and blocking off the arterial wall. So that's the mechanism of the inflammatory model um, of atherosclerosis. And then in 2008, the Jupiter study came out showing that statin tablets reduce inflammation. Not so much LDL, but inflammation in healthy people who did not have cardiovascular disease or hyperlipidemia. <laughs> so statin tablets were then seen to work as mechanisms of reducing inflammation. So in summary, we can quite confidently say that the seven country study was fudged 
that saturated fat does not generally cause heart disease. Vegetable oils inflame the body. We'll go into that in a second. Statin tablets worse by reducing inflammation, not reducing LDL cholesterol. And then with this inflammatory model, <coughs> we can see that sugar inflames the body. Hydrogenated oils and vegetable oils inflame the body. Atherosclerosis is primarily an inflammatory problem. So that really is a big shift over the last 10 years from what we were told, certainly when I was in medical school in the 1980s. And the result of all of this, Sweden, as usual, is leading the way. 2015, after reviewing 16,000 articles on weight gain, Sweden was the first country to reject the low-fat eating plan and nationally adopt a low-carbohydrate, high-fat eating plan as a national guideline. So we'll watch to see if they become the first country to reduce um, obesity problems. <coughs> so what do we know about fats? We know that there are three types of fats, saturated fats, and eating these increases the blood LDL. And saturated fats, we'll see over here, um, have no double bonds in them. And as a result, at air temperature, they are fairly solid. Unsaturated fats, we know are divided into MUFAs and PUFAs, so our EPA, DHA, fish oils, avocados, olives, or olives. And these generally have a single, being a monounsaturated, single double bond in them, and so tend to be liquid at room temperature. And the puffers, then with the polyunsaturated, will have the multiple double bonds. And then the third group are the trans fats, which are the undisputed enemy. They elevate LDL, they decrease HDL, and they increase inflammation. Um, and warning the public and removing them from foods um, has led to a 23% decrease in trans fats in our diets. This study at the bottom was quite interesting. So it's a small study uh, done on 40 women, randomized double-blind trial, where 20 women were given coconut oil, saturated fat, and the result was they reduced their waist circumference and raised their HDL. 20 women were given a puffer, soybean, a soybean oil, and there was no change in waist circumference and no change in HDL. Um, as we all know, um, foods are a mixture of saturated and unsaturated fat. You don't just get um, um, soybean oil just with unsaturated. There's, there's a mixture of them. And so what does cholesterol do? And so if it's no longer the villain, um, perhaps we can start looking at the positive aspects of it. And it turns out that it's an essential part of the body. So it is a really important part of every cell membrane in between the phospholipids. This is um, my clinical field of work uh, and a lot of work and, and lecturing that I do in. Um, it makes steroid hormones in the adrenals and the gonads, um, so cholesterol forming the steroid hormones. Very important in making energy via the Krebs cycle. We saw at the beginning we can get 134 ATPs from one molecule of fat. Under the skin, in the influence of sunshine, it will make vitamin D. And then lastly, it's a transporter of our fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, and coenzyme Q10. So it's a really important and very busy molecule. And we found that it's not just useful nutrient, but it's essential for life. So a study this year um, by four Japanese researchers showed that elderly people with a high cholesterol certainly live longer than people with a low cholesterol. So really things are turning on their heads. So how does cholesterol work? Cholesterol is brought into the body and is carried about in the body on lipid boats. These lipid boats are called lipoproteins, the VLDLs, and then the smaller LDL, and the very small HDL. And on the lipoprotein boat is a signaler called the apolipoprotein, which tells the boat where to go. So from the liver to the body, we'll have apolipoprotein B, and from the body back to the liver, we'll have apolipoprotein E, navigating the boat and telling it where to go. And so we test the APO-B, APO-A ratio, um, looking as an indicator for LDL versus HDL and, and, and cardiovascular health. And within DNA Health, we test these amongst other gene tests, APO-A, APO-B, and APO-E, to see who does well and who does badly um, with these gene tests. So if we have in the gut um, the cholesterol, the fat in the gut, 
Interestingly, 85% of cholesterol in the gut is endogenous. It's from being recircled via the liver back into the gut, and only 15% of it is from our diet. So our diet doesn't make the majority difference to cholesterol in the gut. <laughs> this is taken up um, into the chylomicrons, and, uh, and then by the time it's gone through the liver and it passes in the blood vessels, it's transported into those lipoprotein boats. And it gets as far as the fat cells where it needs to be transported via an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, a very important enzyme which removes cholesterol from the blood and pulls it into the cells for storage. Now what happens when you eat cholesterol plus sugar? So sugar plus cholesterol in the gut, Cholesterol travels along in those boats, glucose travels freely and can cause its mischief and damage with glycation and inflammation. The lipoprotein lipase pulls cholesterol into, into cells for absorption and energy use. But on top of that, the glucose causes an insulin release. Remember, cholesterol does not cause an insulin release, but in the presence of glucose, Glucose will cause insulin release, and that insulin doesn't just push glucose, but it accelerates cholesterol into the cells for storage. <laughs> so a diet of, 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 of fat is one thing, and a diet of fat plus glucose is a very different animal. So lipoprotein lipase oversees cholesterol absorption into fat and muscle cells. So there's our free fatty acid, our LPL, and it pulls it into the cell for the various jobs that it has to do within the cell. But in the presence of glucose, insulin is released, and that accelerates the free fatty acid uh, absorption um, into the cells. And the result of that is increased body fat in the fat cells and the oxidation because of the mixture of these two products. So within cholesterol, it's the oxidized cholesterol, the oxidized LDL, as we saw in the inflammatory model of, of atheromata that causes atherosclerosis. And the sugar and fat combination certainly, as shown in this study, causes oxidized cholesterol. Um, and the more oxidized cholesterol we have, the bigger the coronary artery diseases. So different factors that oxidize LDL become important. So oxidized cholesterol plus sugar are implicated in weight gain and heart disease. And gene testing holds very much a key to this, as gene testing also tests for who becomes inflamed and oxidized um, with the different genetics, with a fatty um, diet, with a, with, a, with a saturated fat diet. So if we look at hypercholesterolemia and familial hypercholesterolemia, um, in familial hypercholesterolemia, there's a problem with the ApoB signaling. And the result of that is that the LDLs, the lipoproteins, carry the triglycerides around the body for two to three times longer than normal. So normally it might carry it around the body for one to two days, it'll carry it around for five days. So we get a much higher level of the LDL in the blood. So blood cholesterol levels are dramatically raised, heart attacks at a young age, it's a genetic illness. <laughs> and in theory, a total cholesterol above seven millimoles per liter, or LDL above five millimoles per liter, would classify as hypercholesterolemia, and 25% of, of the population have cholesterol values at this level. 1% of the population have the familial hypercholesterolemia. So the point is, is that cholesterol still has a part to play in cardiovascular disease, and, and genetic testing we, we are seeing and we are hoping for the future can tease this out and give us a more accurate assessment of things. So to go through the summary again, we have two energy systems, but we tend to rely on gluco the glucose energy system. This is not the platform for it, but the ketogenic energy system and, and, and using it is a fascinating one. And I know that uh, many of the new nutritionists listening um, have been very involved in working with that system. Obesity and cardiovascular disease is a global epidemic. Uh, 37% of the world is obese or is, is obese, and they're more overweight and obese people than they are undernourished. Obesity and cardiovascular disease were thought to be caused by saturated fat in the diet, and the treatment was to remove saturated fat and bring in carbs. And that 
ended up in pretty much disaster. Obesity and cardiovascular disease are inflammatory diseases, and we've spent quite a lot of time going through the, the different studies proving that. Vegetable oils and sugar are the twin villains of obesity, but dietary fat will still contribute to obesity in some people, and the um, idea and the hope is that gene tests and gene testing in the future uh, will be able to tease this out further. Okay, so if we look at the gene test, the common genes that influence how fat in our diet affects us, and I'm sh sorry for that uh, really sort of long background um, to the history of this, but it really, really is important um, to understand where the gene tests fit in. So here's five common gene tests that we do. These are the ones that we prefer doing, looking for um, inflammation, for fat absorption, and for problems with fat. The study at the bot bottom showed that obesity is strongly associated with genetic factors in people with European origin. So doing gene tests when we're looking at obesity um, is a, 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 a very important aspect um, to the puzzle. So if we look at the gene functions, here's five of them. There's our intestine. FABP2 is the gene that helps the absorption of fat from the intestine to the chylomicrons or to the lymphatics. Chylomicrons then carry the cholesterol up to the liver where it gets put into its boats and the, 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 the lipoprotein, the L, LDL boats um, with the ApoB on it carry it away from the liver to the body. Um, working with the LPL, the PPARG assists fat into fat cells at the bottom of the fat cell, when we want to release the fat again, there's a beta receptor, which is very important at releasing fat from this fat cell. And this ADBR2 gene um, oversees that. And then carrying um, the HDL back to the liver again um, is coordinated by APOA2. So we've got FABP2, APOB, PPARG, the beta receptor um, gene, and the APOA2 gene. So, if we look at the FABP gene, the fatty acid binding protein gene, it's a protein, it's an enzyme that accelerates fatty acids through um, the, the mucosal cell and into the lymphatic vessel. And there's a couple of studies that I've picked out um, um, showing the, the, the importance of this when we're looking at are we overabsorbing fat into our body. So, this meta analysis shows that Chinese people with a TT allele, of the FABP gene are at high risk of raised triglycerides if they eat a fatty diet. The weakness of this study was that the sugar content in the diet was not recognized. This next study shows that people with the TT allele who eat a high fat diet and who do not exercise are in danger of turning fat into oxidized fat. So exercise um, when eating fat um, has been shown in other studies too is very, very important. So really the FABP2 gene um, is showing that it's the enzyme that absorbs the fat from the gut into the lymphatics. And if we are over-absorbing it with this TT allele, there's a risk of raised triglycerides. And if we're not exercising, and we've got this allele as a raised of oxidized fat. So if we move on to the next gene test, the ApoB test, we find that it's not particularly useful. So although it seems like a very important um, uh, marker and, and director of things within the LDL, um, directing LDL from the liver to the arteries and to the fat cells, it's not so far been a particularly useful gene test. But I've added it just to show you that it isn't useful. So in this big test on 9,000 Danish people over a long period of time, um, it found that ApoB is not a useful SNP for testing fat um, sensitivity. There was no increase in cardiovascular disease for people with the ApoB SNP. So we move on to the PPARG gene. So this is the gene that helps to pull fat into the cell and more particularly into the nucleus of the cell. So it looks a little complicated, this slide, but it's, it's quite straightforward. So we've got fat coming into the cell. And these fatty acids are helped with PPARG all the way into the cell and through into the nucleus, where they interact with the DNA. And the interaction with the DNA results in an increase in oxidation of fatty acids. 
So that is a, an enzyme that pulls it all the way into the nucleus and the result is a DNA interaction and increased oxidation of fatty acids. So if we look then at this gene historically, <laughs> we find that it's historically had a, a, a big use. So in the winter, um, a thousand or two thousand years ago, we would survive if we stored fat effectively. And the PPRG helps this by helping to pull it in. So what we find within my DNA health is that a lot of people are homozygous positive for PPARG, the thrifty gene. It helps us to survive the winter. So the feeling is that most of us who survived the winter survived it um, partially because we had this PPAR gene which helped to deposit um, fat into fat stores which helped us survive the, the gene. Now another interesting point is that diabetic drugs like rosiglitazone activate the PPAR gene and increase fatty acid absorption which leaves less fat in the blood and allows the body to use glucose for energy. And as a result of this, um, it has been suspended for use in Europe as it's been linked with increased heart attacks and strokes. So overstimulating this enzyme is associated with oxidizing fat within the cell and being associated with heart attacks and stroke. So this is not a good gene to over, um, overstimulate and it's interesting that it was shown to be negative um, with this drug. So, um, here's one of, I think, three studies, uh, so for, and this is the part of the nurses' health study, so quite a big study, 2,000 nurses were followed in a prospective cohort study, and they looked in three different groups, and uh, they're a group for eating fat. And what they found was that people who, who were um, CC homozygous were prone to obesity, inflammation, and diabetes if they ate fat. The weakness was that sugar in the diet was not recognized as a confounding factor. And that's often the case with a lot of these studies, is they just haven't tested for sugar. And we know that sugar plus fat in the diet really is an inflammatory problem. But the conclusion, though, is that PPARG gene, CC homozygous, people who eat fat, may be prone to obesity, inflammation, and diabetes. Three small, well, three other studies. This was the first one. Was a small study on Arabs um, in the Middle East associated PPRG, fat, and obesity. Um, a large study associates exercise with improved PPRG expression um, and improved sugar metabolism. So that's the second study uh, we've shown on genes showing that how exercise really helps these fat genes. And then a large Finnish study associated PPRG with diabetes and sugar metabolism. So sugar and PPRG is important, as we'll see in the next um, presentation as well. So if we get to the beta receptor gene, and this is a really important one and sort of a, a favorite of mine. So if we imagine we, there's an artery, there's free fatty acids and glucose coming in under the influence of insulin um, into the cell. Now it's time that we want to use that energy again. So the triglyceride is broken up and the fatty acids should be released via the beta receptor. The beta receptor really is, is the plug at the bottom of the cell. And if it opens, the fat can come out of the cell and back into the system, and we can use it somewhere else for energy, not just storing it. Now the problem is, is that the same insulin that pushed the glucose and fat into the cell is a blocker of the beta receptor. It blocks that beta receptor and switches it off. So we get hungry two hours later after eating, we can't release fat for energy, and what do we have to do? We have to eat again. So that really is one of the negative side of the cycle of, of insulin. But on the other hand, these beta receptors are opened with caffeine. So that would, is um, one of the, the two main reasons why athletes before exercise might take caffeine. Um, that beta receptor opening allows fat to be released and allows us to exercise for longer. Um, lose weight and stay fuller for longer. So these beta receptors are really quite important. And we'll find that they're distributed around the body where we don't have fat. So if we're putting on visceral fat, it means that genetically we do not have a lot of beta receptors releasing fat back for energy in that area. We struggle to lose weight in that area. So wherever we have weight gain tends to be a beta receptor deficient area. And interestingly, women have fewer beta receptors, and so for that reason tend to struggle to lose weight more than guys, and particularly in exercise. 
So the ADBR2 gene, here's three studies supporting it, um, and there's two ADBR2 genes that we, all, that, that we measure, the GLU16 and the GLI27, and these alleles have significant excess abdominal weight, so people with these alleles, and they struggle to unblock their beta receptors. And another study, again, showed if you are positive for that homozygous gene, you will have a higher level of obesity and particularly visceral abdominal obesity where you will tend to have fewer beta receptors in the first place. And the ones that you do have are not working properly. This smaller study of 112 of these people and people with this beta receptor defect have a high chance of abdominal obesity. Okay, and so then the last gene we're looking at here is the ApoA2, so the signaler that takes the um, HCL back from the fat cells to the liver. And ApoA2 is, turns out, is a very useful gene test, much more useful than the ApoB test. So results from three ongoing trials were taken over 20 years, a long time, from three and a half thousand subjects. Um, and these trials were the Framium um, uh, trial, the Golden trial, and the Boston Puerto Rican study. So different populations. And the result was people with the ApoA2 CC, so the weaker allele, the CC allele, who ate high saturated fat, had significantly higher obesity in all three groups. A weakness was that saturated, or that, that sugar was not mentioned as a confounding factor. The strength, as I've said before, is a large study, different populations. So people who had a high saturated fat had significantly higher obesity. So these are the fat gene results um, in summary. So we've got the FABP2 associated with eating a fatty diet and pushing too much fat into the system causing a high triglyceride level and oxidized fats. We move up to the ApoB, which is not particularly useful, unfortunately. We come down from the artery into the fat cell where the PPRG helps to oversee things. And here we find that a fatty diet worsened diabetes and obesity, and it's helped with exercise if you have that weakened gene. At the bottom of the fat cell, there's a beta receptor to release fat back into the system for energy. And those beta receptors, if they are weakened, it's associated with increased abdominal fat. So wherever the beta cells are minimal, we'll tend to put on weight, and that's the abdomen. And then the fat is transported back to the liver and signaled by the ApoA2, and there's a strong association here of eating saturated fat and obesity. So saturated fat comes in there with people with that gene. So how does that pan out if you were to look at a MyDNA Health um, um, result um, of one of your clients? Um, um, gene tests. And here is an example of someone's uh, gene test. And so you'll see here are the results, here are the genes, and here's the explanation. And the results are in yellow, which means heterozygous, green, which means healthy, and the red, which means homozygous. So this person then has got FABP2, APOA2, PPARG, and ADBR2. And you do not need to know the ins and outs of all of these genes. I've gone through them now for your interest and for further education, but you do certainly not need to know the ins and outs of them. And so really what this will show and what will be given um, as a result of this is that we calculate a combined scoring for all four genes, and that combined scoring for this person means that they are at moderate risk of fat overabsorption. And the explanation there, or the advice given there, will be according to the gene test we performed, and it's not three gene tests, it's four. You have a genetic tendency to overabsorb some fats, which can contribute to obesity. You should avoid fried foods, trans fats, eat moderate animal-based fats, saturated fats. So we're not saying cut out all animal fats, saturated fats, eat moderate animal-based fats. Um, and ensure that they are grass-fed and not corn-fed. So important. You'll still gain benefit by including healthy fats such as fishy oil, olive, hemp, and even primrose oil as part of the eating plan. <laughs> and what can and should be added to that is the importance of reducing sugar, but we add that in the sugar part of the report um, as well. So that's what will come out in the report. Um, and it's really sort of color-coded and quite straightforward. There's a big explanation, 
and from your point of view, you do not need to know all these details, but I hope that insight that we went into um, what was interesting and useful. So for this kid, it won't always work to just look at um, the sugar fat content in his diet, and often we need to look a lot deeper than that. And that's why we suggest uh, within my DNA health that we look at the multifactorial things that can contribute to the weight gain. So we would look at the sleep pattern, the food cravings, there's two genes for that, there's a questionnaire for that, the liver toxicity, and we'll do that in the fourth uh, webinar, um, the stress and burnout, so the adrenal hormones, and that essentially is from a questionnaire um, which is very similar to the metagenics, I mean if everyone knows the metagenics um, questionnaire. Um, the sugar metabolism, which we'll get into next time, so the sugar genes, the fat overabsorption genes and the fat release genes um, that we've done now. So we would give a, a, a result on each one of these things um, to give the weaknesses um, of where the person is likely to be causing weight gain and where they should lose weight gain. And here's just a listing of the different gene tests and the questionnaires that we do on all of those different points. So we've taken a lot of time and effort to make it a holistic, multifactorial approach um, to weight loss um, and not just a simple, straightforward thing. And remember from the first talk that these questionnaires are so important um, because the epigenetics, who you are today, how your genes are being expressed today are so important and it's not just the gene tests that we, we would look at. So then in summary, and I think I've stuck to the one hour, um, and I hope it didn't get too slowed up in the middle, um, and, and there was a lot of information to go through. But in summary, um, we have the two energy systems, but tend to rely on the glucose energy system. Um, obesity and cardiovascular disease is most certainly a global epidemic. So obesity and cardiovascular disease were thought to be caused by saturated fats and were treated, as we know, by removing saturated fats. But we found out and we discovered quite happily over the last 20 years that they really are essentially inflammatory diseases and that carbohydrates and puffers worsen this. Vegetable oils and sugars um, are the twin villains of obesity. Dietary fat, I believe the pendulum is going to swing back a bit and we'll see this with gene testing. Dietary fat will still contribute to obesity and cardiovascular disease in some people and genetic tests can identify people who become obese and ill from eating fats and hopefully you've seen that although some of the science behind it's a little complicated, the gene tests that you will see are very straightforward and all the permutations and mathematics um, have been done already. If you're interested in this topic and, and you want to read more and you haven't read this all already, um, and I know it's um, it's been sort of widely talked about, then Nina Teichholz's book really is very good. It takes point by point um, and deconstructs the original um, diet heart hypothesis and, uh, and puts all the studies forward as to why the inflammatory model um, for cardiovascular disease is really the way forward. So that is the talk. That is that. Megan, um, Bernie, have we had um, any questions? Um, has it been useful? Hi, Duncan. Yeah. Um, so um, there is a question, but I was just wondering if you want to do just um, loft up the poll results from the question. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Right, there we go. Okay, I hadn't seen that until now. Okay, so I presume everyone can see that. Dietary sugar, 95%. Dietary fat, 5%. And, you know, and, and I hope the point also is is that there's nothing set in stone. I, I was recently at the conference which was sort of pro-sugar inflammatory, and every time someone made a point in that direction, there was lots of clapping. And there was almost booing every time anyone sort of talked about supporting... Um, um, the possible dangers of, of cholesterol. Um, and I think we all need to keep a very open mind about things. Um, so, um, am I still on? Um, yes, we can still hear you. You can still hear me. Sorry, I, my, my screen just um, half disappeared. Okay. Um, here we go. I'm back again. So, um, so the people who said... Um, the 5% you said that fat is the main cause. I'd be very interested to, to hear why. 
Um, and there's always things that we can learn about it and different points of view are always very valid. Um, but I, I do think that the majority of people, as shown by that poll, are really behind the inflammatory model and the sugar-based model. Um, are there questions, Megan? Um, so here's a question. I'm just going to read it out. I'm just juggling two laptops here. Um, you mentioned that gene testing will help with familial hypercholesterolemia, but what can you do with this, and does it automatically cause cardiovascular disease? Or again, does it depend on whether it is oxidized? First up, we don't do familial hypercholesterolemia testing, um, so it's not part of my DNA health. You can have it done. Um, if you are heterozygous positive for familial hypercholesterolemia, remember it's not just hypercholesterolemia, it's familial hypercholesterolemia, if you're heterozygous positive, then it has been shown that um, different treatments from fibrates through to statins are probably very useful. If you're homozygous positive for it, um, then the um, prognosis is, is, is not nearly as good. Um, but we don't do that. Let's see if I, I finish answering that. And does it automatically cause cardiovascular disease, or does it again, depending on whether it's oxidized? There, there will be, there will, because of the level of LDL, the high, high level of LDL um, molecules. I mean, if my level is 5.2, um, a lot of these people will have can have levels of 40, um, and so the chances of having oxidized LDL oxidized cholesterol is massive, um, and so there will be a very high chance of oxidization, a very high chance of foam cell formation and atheromative formation. But reducing oxidization, reducing that side and that risk is also um, essential, is important. Um, have we got any more questions here? No. Okay. All right. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so. If someone has the PPARG defective um, fat genes, um, what would your recommendation be? Um, is it dietary or are there nutritional supplements that could help support that person's health? Okay, um, thanks Bernie. So if, if someone's got the PPAR gene and their homozygous dominant for it, um, on its own it's not very useful. Um, so it's the thrifty gene. Um, it's the gene that we do find a lot of people have. We'll notice it, but on its own, we wouldn't do a huge amount. We would also look at um, the other genes. So I'm just going to go back to them. Um, so our FABP2 gene and um, our APOA2 gene, ADBR2 gene. We'd look at all of the genes associated with it and look at the risk um, there. If someone um, does have, in fact, this result here, we'll, no, I can't find it. Um, so if there we go, um, so we will give the advice that obviously we need to stop eating trans fats. We need to really stop eating vegetable oils. Um, and as far as saturated fat is concerned, um, our advice is that you would stick to pasture-fed um, saturated fats. You wouldn't overindulge in saturated fats because remember, with with sugar, there's that big chance of oxidation. Um, but that you would be uh, certainly, uh, e eating um, saturated fats, we, we, we are very, very comfortable with. Um, um, and then supplementing it, we would really look at supplements to, to decrease your sugar levels. Um, so we have a, a supplement called Sugar Block, um, which has got about 10 different ingredients in it to reduce sugar levels in, in the blood. So if you've had a particularly sort of bad sugar day, um, we strongly suggest that you would um, you would be taking that to reduce sugar levels, which then reduces any chance of oxidization um, of any um, um, fat in you. But the point is, is that really um, we you know the, the opinion has really shifted, and and, and we do like the anti-inflammatory fats. But does that answer it? That's great. Thanks, Duncan. Okay. Fine. Um, then I was going to say, should we call it night? But there is a. Okay. Megan has been furiously typing next to me here and answering lots of questions. Um, so, is it correct to assume that the vast majority of obese people will be significantly improved 
by ordinary diet measures plus exercise. That's to say the standard diet exercise advice is worthwhile for everyone. Gene testing comes into play. Someone implements such health changes and still cannot lose weight. I, you know, I, I think it's absolutely fair. You know, if if you are getting results without doing gene testing um, with with your clients for losing weight and you're very happy um, that you're you're moving ahead with that, then that's great. Carry on with that. I think the gene testing is very useful because it's going to give added insight, a different level, um, a different dimension um, to their health. And it has been shown um, in, in, in a Stanford study and a couple of other studies that with gene testing, we should be able to identify those specific weaknesses of weight gain and accelerate the results. They only need to do them once, and once they've done them, they've got them for life. But yes, you can quite happily, if, you, if you're doing well with your eating plans, um, you can quite happily get along without the gene testing. Megan, are there any more questions? No. Okay. I think I see Megan furiously answering the last few individual ones, but there's, there's no more big questions. All right. Um, Bernie? Hi, Duncan. Okay. So should we end it there then? Um, yes, uh, just a, a note, um, a number of um, attendees have asked about um, the recording and the slides. I will be sending that out this week, so you'll have the recording and then um, the, a copy of the presentation slides as well as a handout for your notes. Um, just a reminder as well that the next webinar is scheduled for the 8th of September. And that'll get that'll be again at um, 6:30 p.m. And that will be on nutrigenomics for sugar metabolism that Duncan has uh, mentioned. We'll be sending out the details. Um, working with the CAM conferences again, so watch out for those emails. Great, thanks, Bernie. Um, okay, fine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for um, tuning in. I don't know if that's the right term, tuning in anymore. But um, thanks for being part of this. Thank you for all the questions. And um, and if there are any further questions, they can always be emailed through as well, and we can get to those questions. It does sometimes take time to let things sink in. And I think it is worthwhile going through the webinar again, or, or the slides, certainly, because um, there was a lot of information in that. <laughs>